We're going to go on a journey. I see this so clearly when the Lord mapped this out in my mind, the journey that he he took me from poverty to prosperity and why? And why? So I start here. The reason why God wants you to be blessed is so his church is provided for to preach the gospel to the nations. It's about the end times. Do y'all know that there's an end time? The end time is actually uh, the beginning of a new time. That's the end times. So I say, it scared a lot of people. The end times, are like, the world's coming to an end. Well, it's coming to the end the way you know it. I, I like to say it like this. It's like when bell bottoms went away and straight legs came in. You know, it's just, that was the end times of bell bottoms until bell bottoms came back. I, that really threw me for a curve. It threw me for a curve. I didn't know what to do with that. And they didn't come with hip huggers this time around. So those gray hairs, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't have gray hairs, I know you don't know anything that I'm talking about. I understand. I understand. Michael, I know you're too young. You don't, you don't remember the, the hip huggers with the big white belt? You all remember that? Come on, the, the big old collars that you had to have that collar that went all the way out here and stuck out a little bit. Did you all do that with platform shoes? Hector? No? I had to throw him in there. I think he's our sen- most senior member right now. I don't know. Billy's kept turning gray. He's catching up. Look out. He's catching up. <laughs> so... So I saw this, this vein, I saw this vein. So we're gonna take a little journey today, the vein of prosperity and why he wants us to prosper. And some people challenge this, this, this statement, but, but we're not gonna challenge it. We're gonna lean into it, amen? We're gonna lean into it, how God wants you to prosper. God wants you to prosper his way, not the world's way. The world's way of prosperity, you go out and you end up buying a ton of stuff and get into a ton of debt and get a lot of credit cards and get a lot of, get a lot of mortgages and a lot. That's not the way God wants it done. God wants it like this. There's a scripture that says, come buy and eat you who have no money. Have you ever heard that scripture? Anybody here ever heard that scripture? Let me get it for you real quick. Watch this. Which always blew me away. Come buy and eat you who have no money. No. <laughs> so I was studying the book of Acts and I want you to see this. Isaiah 55, 1, watch this. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you who have no money. And some people stop right there. See, we're supposed to be poor. Well, watch what he says. Come by. You who have no money, come buy, B-U-Y, come buy. How do you buy if you have no money? See, the, world's gonna, the world is reversed to the way the kingdom works. Isaiah 55, 1. It says, come buy and eat, and with an exclamation mark. Come buy wine, milk, without money and without cost. How do you buy without cost? Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Come buy and eat. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? That, that's what we do today. That's the way the world works. And that's why, that's why you're in debt and that's why you're poor and that's why you struggle and that's why you're having battles and, and, all, and that's why sometimes you live from paycheck to paycheck because, because you're operating according to the world system. But there is a heavenly system that I want you to catch on to. Here's the world system. The world system is that I exchange my time for money. Your life, you're exchanging your life for money. How many of y'all know how much you make per hour? Let me see your hand, come on. You know how much you make per hour, right? Come on, let me see your hands. You know how much you make per hour. You know how much you're worth per hour, right? You know how much you're worth per hour. I like that. <laughs> you know how much you're worth per hour. That means one hour of your time has a value on it. See, that's the world system. You put a dollar, 
Like the government puts a stamp on you. Taxes puts a stamp on you. Everything puts a stamp on you. You're worth this much and this much. And in business, I need to, I need to get so many people into my business because each person spends on average this much and etc. And the per capita per home in this city is this much and I can make an investment. That's the way investors work. That's, that's the way they look at it. it every, every head is worth a value or a dollar, but the kingdom doesn't work that way. Kingdom doesn't work that way. The kingdom works, come by and eat you who have money, is, is that you will eat from trees you did not sow. That's the way the kingdom works. You'll live in houses you did not build. But you have to live according to the kingdom and live according to the kingdom system in order for you to reap the benefits of the kingdom. The world system, I'm sick, I go take a pill, or I go to the doctor and I receive my healing. The kingdom system, I'm sick, I go get the elders to lay hands on me and to pray for me to receive the healing. That's, that's two totally different systems that contradict each other and don't fight, don't, don't, don't flow together. So I say that in preparation for what you're going to hear today because when I went to Acts, and the we've been studying Acts, and when I went to the book of Acts and I read the scripture that I'm going to read here in a minute, the Lord impressed in my heart and says, you need, to give them this, you need to give them this directive that's written in the word and how this word works. So in Genesis 26, verse 12 through 24, watch what it says. It says, then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. He sowed in the land and the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Just that one verse, if you have a problem with prosperity, that one verse throws it in your face three times. He says, he says and the man began to prosper and, and continued to prosper until he became very prosperous. And somebody tells me, I have a problem with the, the message of prosperity. Well, then figure out what to do with verse 13. Because it gives it to you three times. Shall prosper, prosper, and prosper. <laughs> Amen. Verse 14. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great numbers of servants. So the Philistines envied him. The world envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped all the wells which... His father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham and his father, and they had filled them with the earth. In other words, they say, I don't like your prosperity, so I'm going to fill in the wells that are making you rich. That's what the world will do to you. Come on, let's just get that. Let's, let me pause there for a second. The world don't want you prosperous. So the world is going to try to figure out how to tell you that that's not godly. Because they've already figured out they can't detour you from God, so let me make something up. Okay, but you got to get your faith in line with the word of God. And because there, there's a purpose of prosperity. It's a purpose for prosperity. There's a purpose for money. There's purpose for jobs. And it's not all about paying bills. And we're going to get there. So here he was prospering and they didn't like that he was prospering. So they said, we're going to pour. Okay, you're making all this money on these wells. So dig up his wells. Put, put the, so Isaac dug again another well, verse 18. And Isaac dug again another well of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. So he gave these wells names. And Isaac's servant dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water's ours. Give it to me. Give it to me. Started fighting. So he called the name of the well Isik, which means quarrel. The word Isik means quarrel because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called the name Sitna, which means enmity. We're enemy. Curse. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. Now watch this for a second. Here's what was happening. Let's picture this. He was digging up wells. And it, this was a, a, a heritage business. Did you catch the part? His father Abraham had dug up the wells. But, but the Philistines came and they buried it. So now, now he's going. And he's uh, uncovering these wells that his father had dug originally. So this is a family heritage. This is a family business. So he's just going back and reclaiming the wells that they had taken away when his dad died. 
So they start pulling out. They start getting prosperous, and they're getting jealous, so they buried it up. So he just goes a little further and says, okay, I'll dig another well. And they bury it up, and he goes a little further, and I'll dig another well. But here's what was happening. What was happening is as he was digging the wells, the wells got further and further away from the city. There's a law of supply and demand. And when something's easily obtained, the prices are usually low. But when something is difficult to obtain, the price is high. That's why diamonds are higher than pebble stones. So the further away he got, the more prosperous he was getting because it cost the people more to get what he was giving them and what he was selling them. There's this, a great scripture that says, God causes your enemies to rise up over your head. Those are the guys that talk bad about you and mock you and they criticize you and they said, don't go to that center church. That pastor over there is a little crazy and all those people, they got all those kids running around. You don't want to go over there. They say all that stuff. The enemy's just trying to drive you away. But the scripture says God causes your enemies to rise up over your head to drive you to your wealthy place. You're being driven. Praise the Lord when somebody talks bad about you. Oh, 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 oh. come on. Let it rain, let it rain. Let it rain, let it rain. When they don't like me, oh, let it rain, let it rain. They give me dirty faces. Let it rain, let it rain. Come on, let it rain. That's okay. I'm okay with it. I love you either way. I love you more now. I love you more. So this is what's happening here. So he starts putting these names on it. And he says, he says, so then he dug another well and they didn't quarrel. So he called that one Roboth, which means spaciousness in room. Because he said, now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to, to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to them. The same night, and I am the Lord, your father, Abraham, do not fear, for I am with you, and I will bless you, and I'll multiply you, your descendants, for my servants, Abraham's sake. He says, I'm going to bless you. Go to 28, chapter 28. So now this, we see this man so wealthy, so rich. And then God lays a covenant down here that is enacted even to this moment. The word covenant basically means a contract. There's an agreement. The, 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 the gospel is about if this, then that. Everybody say, if this, then that. If you do this, then you get that. That's the way when you buy your car, that's what happens. If you make the payment, you get to drive it. See, you think you own the car, the bank owns the car. Quit paying, find out who owns the car. That owner will eventually show up, stalk you down, harass you, and steal the car in the middle of the night <laughs> because you broke the if this. So if you break the if this, then, then that means it's going to be taken from you. If you pay, you get to drive. If you stop paying, we shall take it back. If this, then that. That's what covenant is. If you do this, and then I'll do that. It's the same thing. So, he establishes this covenant. I want you to see it in Genesis 28, 12. It says that he dreamed a dream. Now he's, Jacob's down on the floor. He's all blessed and everything. He's out in the wilderness. He's resting under the stars. Camping. How would you like that? Come on, Michael. Camping out in the stars. He set up a couple of rocks for pillows. And he dreamed a dream. Behold in the dream. Watch this. Behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. A ladder set up on the earth. And its top reached the heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you are lying, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the east and to the, to the west, to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall 
be blessed. Not some of the families, not only the North Americans, not the South, just the South Americans, not the Jewish, not the Palestinians, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. The whole earth shall be blessed because of this right here. This covenant. This is a covenant, he's saying. I'm going to bless you. And I want you seeing a, a dream in the supernatural, a system. I want you to catch this. The ladder was a system of transportation to take something from earth to God, because he's up on the top, and from God to the earth. See, too many times we've bypassed this point of the story, which is the main point of the story. Because he says all the families of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. So the angels of the Lord are ascending, descending, and ascending, descending, ascending, descending. And obviously, the angels are there blessing all the families of the earth. Because of him, because of that covenant, the covenant that God has that we're going to find here in a moment. So you all seeing this? Are you seeing this? Are you, do you all have the picture in your head right now? It's, this, it's a teleport system, you know. I mean, we watch Star Trek and we see them. They beam me up, Scotty, you know. We say beam up. Yeah. So he's saying, beam it up, Jesus. Take, you're taking something. The angels are taking something from the earth and they're carrying it to heaven. And they're taking something from heaven and they're carrying it to the earth. Because why else would the angels, why would he see the angels ascending and descending? Why would there be a ladder, a transportation system? And why would God be sitting on the very top of that ladder? Especially after saying, you will be blessed because of what? You'll be blessed because you're a How many of you all are families of the earth? Let me see how many families of the earth we have here. Come on, wave at me. This is called Center Church Aerobics. It gets rid of those bingo arms, you know, the bingo arm. <laughs> Sorry, my brother. I said a little, this guy right here has a little humor. He thinks he's a comic sometimes. <laughs> I'm a family. Everybody say, I'm a family of the earth. I'm a family of the earth, so I shall be blessed. There's a blessing that's going to come on me, but why? Deuteronomy 8, 18. Deuteronomy 8, 18. Hallelujah. Sometimes it feels good just to go through these pages instead of going like that. Deuteronomy 8, 18. This is a powerful scripture. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth. He wants you to remember God. Are you remembering God? How do you remember God? How do you see God? What you, he's, he healed me. He delivered me, saved me. He fixed my issues, my problems. He restored my marriage. He He's the one I lean on. He's giving me the word. What are those things that are causing you to remember God? And if, and if you don't have enough stories of remembering God, keep coming. We're building stories even now. And you shall remember the Lord your God. Why? Why do you remember the Lord your God? For it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Watch this. That he may establish. He's trying to establish that God may establish his covenant his contract, he's trying to fulfill his agreement, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. In other words, this agreement that happened hundreds of years ago with Jacob, God has a covenant with Jacob to bless the families of the earth and he's trying to establish the blessings on the families of the earth. Remember God, because he's trying to establish his prosperity on the families of the earth. But you have to remember God. You have to remember God. That means you have to follow his precepts. If this, then that. If you don't follow through God's if this, you're not remembering God. Oh, but he's a good God. Why can't he do things without requiring anything from me? 
See, that's the definition of a sugar daddy. And even sugar daddies require something of you. Come on now. I mean, my kids, you could ask them when they were little, I wouldn't let them eat unless if they threw the trash away and clean their room and do what they, you start taking things away from them when they disobey and they don't do, you find out what the currency is, no matter what age they are. If this, then that. If you don't do this, you don't get that. God's the one who created us and he knows and if this, then that motivates us because Will you work for where you work at if, if they don't pay you? Come on now. They're going to tell you they pay you all this stuff, but then they don't pay you. Will you still be working there? They didn't fulfill this. If, this, if I do this, you're going to pay me that. They didn't do the that. And somebody breached the contract. So God is saying here, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Why does he want to give you the power to get wealth? Because he's trying to establish the covenant that we found in Genesis that all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he shows us how to be blessed. He walks us through the word and he shows us how to be blessed. In Deuteronomy, he shows us how to give our tithes and our offerings, our gifts of faith, our seed and our sacrifice. Write that down. If you can, if you can write, write these five things down. These are five areas of giving. It's your tithes, your offerings, your gifts of faith, your seed, and your sacrifice. And if you haven't heard that message yet, just hang in there. I'll get to it again. And, uh, but I have it up on my YouTube, but one of the thousand videos that's up there has that, several of them. But, but write this down. Five areas of giving is your tithes, your offerings, your gifts of faith, your seed, and your sacrifice. Because every one of those five areas... If you attach yourself to it and you do the if this in that one area, all of them have a then that. Okay? Tithe, offering, gifts of faith, seed, sacrifice. Tithe, windows of heaven open, blessing poured out, not room enough to receive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Offerings, God will give back to you. The Bible says, given it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shaking, running over. Gifts of faith. You're, you're giving because you're believing God for something and that thing that you have your faith attached to and you're working your faith, you shall receive. Your seed, which is what you're sowing, whatsoever a man sows, that is what he's also gonna reap and you reap it back 30, 60, 100 full return. See, those are if this, then that. Sacrifice, which is the one I love the most, but it's the hardest one to give. A sacrifice is I don't wanna do it it's with attitude and everything. I don't. Why do I have to do it? But you do it anyway. That's a sacrifice. It's Jesus in the garden. Let this cup pass before me. Father, if there's another way. He was concerned. He was debating with God. The Father, his own Father who sent them down. He being the Word at that moment. He became the ultimate sacrifice. If there be another way. Silence, that became the sacrifice. Then he said, not my will. This part blows me away. He just told me, this is not my will. I don't want to die. Wow. He freely went to the cross after that. But at that moment, he was under due rest. He was under extreme stress. So much that he bled. His sweat was blood. The capillaries of high blood pressure was pouring out of his skin. Probably his eyes. He sweat blood. That's what the scripture says, which is a sign. Ask anybody in the medical society. It's an extreme level of high blood pressure, under stress, hypertension, like you and I have never, nor do we ever desire to have. But he sacrificed because that's what made him the sacrifice. I don't want to do it, but I do it anyway. And what you receive is the favor of God. You get to go to God and you say, God, will you do me a favor? Jesus hung on the cross and he said, forgive them. That was a favor. Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Isn't that powerful? Wow. If this, then that. So if we look at this in the book of Acts, chapter, chapter 10, I want you to see this. This is really, every time I get to this scripture, it's kind of hard for me not to take you down this journey 
of this teleport system of what God uses. And I'm going to show you the teleport system, okay? I'm going to show you. I just showed you the earth portion of it, and I'm going to show you the heavenly portion. And I'm going to show you, if you knew how to do that, you know, have you ever heard, has anybody ever told you, hey, I got a good investment for you? Like this cryptocurrency, you know, you've heard about cryptocurrency, right? Oh, I put money in the cryptocurrency and it, and it, and it multiplies and I cash out all these profits. And it's almost like a magic box. I put money in there, I wait a little bit and I get it right back out. And then suddenly you got these people that rip people off and, and then they end up losing everything. But many people say you can make these investments and do this and do this. And, and if you put the money in there, then all this money is going to come right back. And you, people make an investment in this business, I'm going to get money back. I mean, they're all, they're all a chance. It's all a chance. But I'm going to show you God's investment system and how, how his investment system is not a chance because he's the creator of the universe and he created this process. And I'm going to show you why he created the process, okay? Watch this in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God. That means he remembered God always. What did he do? He feared God with all of his household who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always always. This was his definition. He feared God. That means he, re he remembered God always. With all of his household and he gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? Watch what the Lord says. So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Hello. Wait, wait, wait. The Lord says your, your prayers, this angel of the Lord, your prayers and your giving have built a memorial, a monument a testimony before God. When you pray, there's a transportation system that is carrying your prayers up this ladder that Jacob saw. The angels are taking it up to God and then God is doing what God does and sends down blessings. It's powerful. Your prayers and your alms have come up before God, and it's building a memorial. What's a memorial? A memorial it reminds you of a story. It's a forever remembering of who that person is. I, I love memorials. I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, focused on, on altars and memorials um, before God and testimonies and honoring people who've lived their life or have done a good deed or if they've, they've done something for the kingdom, I, I want to be able to build a memorial for them. We have a prayer garden with the name of a saint that I didn't get a chance to get to know. I met her a handful of times, didn't really know who she was, but we named the prayer garden after her. She passed many years ago before I got here. And so now we have the Patricia, Patricia Richardson prayer garden in the front of the building with a plaque so if anybody goes there to pray, because it was said that she was a woman that believed in prayer, if anybody went to her, they had a problem, she would say, did you pray about it? I believe I need to do it. Did you pray about it? Did you pray about it? Did you pray about it? So one of the saints in the house said, pastor, is there any way we can do to memorialize her? And so I said, what would you like to do? And we began, began to talk and we created this memorial. Every time I go there and pray, and I go there every day, and I go and I pray, I see this memorial with her name on it. Hallelujah. And if that does something to me, what does this memorial do before God? It's your prayer, your prayers, and your giving is building this memorial before God. Because God's no respect to a person. It wasn't just Cornelius. Unless if you don't do the if this, fear God. He said he feared God. He feared God with his whole household. He reverenced God. 
He remembered God. He gave his tithes and his offerings and his gifts of faith, his seed, his sacrifice. He prayed for the people. He prayed for everybody. He was a faithful man. He followed after the systems that are in the Word of God. All this is in the Word of God. He follows after every single dot and tittle of the Word. If the Scripture says, don't take anything out, that means everything in there means something. Hello? How dare I say, oh, that's not for today? Well, well rip it out of your Bible. I'll watch you. <laughs> so your prayers and your alms come up before God as a memorial. Matthew chapter 6. Are y'all getting anything here? Huh? Matthew chapter 6. I'm building a case here because the Lord's going to prosper you, but not a little bit. And it doesn't have anything to do with greed. And it has nothing to do that you're going to get a brand new car, you're going to get a brand new house, you're going to get all that. It has nothing to do with that. You, you, you most likely will get it. You most likely will. But you're not doing this for that. Are you all with me on that statement? It's about remembering God. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about what he wants, what he requires. The utility bill on this building, all the services that we do, Sunday morning, we have three services, two in the morning, one in the afternoon. We have Tuesday night, the prayer group here that comes on Tuesday night. We don't charge them rent at all. But they're ministering to people, the ACs are on, the lights are on the lights, the bathrooms, the toilet paper. There's expenses. Wednesday night tonight, there's expenses. Just the utility bill can run up to $8,000. $120,000 square foot facility, and there's a lot of rooms here that there's no AC on. This is an expensive building to operate. Empty seats are potentials of souls that need to be filled. And the only thing that will fill this is work of witnessing. Saints coming up with creative ideas. Uh, did they give these to you for free? Cost money. You prayed. I want to do something. She says, Pastor, I'd like to do. What can we do? I want to do this. I said, let's do it. She goes, gets the best deal. You probably called around. Didn't pay the highest price. Just paid a, 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 a modest price. and Did what you can to buy as many as you can to help you tell people there's a seat here waiting for you to talk about who Jesus, to hear about who Jesus is and to fix all your problems. That's what these cards are for. What's at the center of your life is the question that's asked of the people. This costs money. All this costs money. And everybody says, oh, why you ask for money? Well, because uh, AEP wants money. The power company will want money. The trash company raised the price. They want money and they want more money. A phone company wants more money. Hey, I'm a church. Can't you give it to me for free? I'll give you a tax write-off. They say, yeah, right. We're up in your price. And rightfully so. I don't complain about it. When I got here, the, the light bill, I'll never forget the first month light bill that I ever saw was almost $17,000. Needed efficient. I said, I need to be a good steward with every dime that comes in. And I negotiated, negotiated, negotiated. It was at $21 or 21 cents a kilowatt, and I got the price down, and I got it so ridiculously low. When anybody calls and says, I want to negotiate, and I want to put sell whatever solar panels on there, and I tell them how much I'm paying, they go, how you doing that? Said, Jesus. This is Jesus. Jesus. They said, there's no way. I said, I mean, can you send me? Some of them said, send me the bill. They see the bill, and they said, man, we just can't do it. I told you. Figure it out. You want my business? Because I'm being a good steward with God's money. Hello. So here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths nor rust destroy, and where thieves 
Do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm talking about this transportation system, that there's a ladder that, that uh, Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending and saw God on top. And then the scripture of Cornelius and his story that his prayers and his alms went up and built a monument before God. There's this transportation system that's taking place here. And now over here, I'm showing you that Jesus is saying that you can actually lay up riches in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. Have you all ever had anything stolen from you? It's not, it's not fun. My wife and I were, were with a youth pastor of another church at a restaurant and it was chilly like it is tonight. And she had her nice leather jacket on and she had her purse or her wallet in the pocket. We put it on the back of the chair. When it came time for us to eat, we, I mean, to, to pay the bill, we got up and she reached for her jacket and it was gone. Man, we were like in shock. Who would take this jacket? And her wallet, everything was inside there. I said, oh my gosh, that means I got to pay the bill? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's it. And so, and the, I'll never forget the response of the youth pastor. You got to be careful with youth pastors because they think different. Youth pastor said, okay, look, we're going to look for it. We looked around and he goes, but wait, I'm going to pray first. And he prayed like this. He goes, in the name of Jesus, he says, whoever stole this jacket, let their legs fall off right now. That's what he said. Okay, now look for a guy that's walking on stubs. <laughs> it was the funniest thing we ever heard. <laughs> okay, now look for somebody that's walking on stumps. That's what he said. I said, Terry, you're a nut. A few weeks later, someone came over to the house. I found this wallet with guilt all on the face. She was on her knees. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So this scripture is saying, lay up, lay down. So Jesus, Jesus said these words. Jesus is saying, you can, you can do a lay up to heaven of treasures. You can lay it up in heaven where moth and rust won't destroy. It'll come back and reap benefits to you, but you got to put it in heaven because in heaven is the greatest investment. The greatest investment system ever is in heaven. There's a multiplication system. Now, God is a wise businessman. There's a reason why Jewish people are the way they are, very wise in their business attributes. And Jesus being Jewish and God calling the Jewish his children. And, uh, and he knows where to make good investments. And, and if a person is going to make uh, and follow through his principles and precepts, why will he not invest more in that person? Why would he not give more to that person who's doing righteous and doing what God has said? God's a just God. He does. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. Oh, glory a Dios. I like this. Flipping through the Bible. You should come take a look at all my notes over here. I got message upon messages. Hebrews 7 verse 8. Here, mortal men receive tithes. But there, he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Who has the testimony that he's alive? Who's the one who who's alive in heaven? Who's who died here and is alive now and is in heaven? Who so his testimony is that he was dead now he's alive. So his testimony is Jesus is is alive. Amen? So he's saying this passage in Hebrews it's saying here on earth mortal men receive tithes. I'll put this in here. Mortal men I'm mortal, steward of God, 
not trying to raise a salary, but trying to do the work of God without any hindrance. And this tithe comes to my hands, and now I'm attached to the scripture. Here, mortal men, I'm mortal, receives the tithe. I put it here so that way the light bill can be taken care of. But the moment I do this, there's a transportation system in the supernatural, in the invisible world, in the world that you do not see with your physical eyes, according to the scriptures. There's something supernatural taking place the moment this goes in here and you turn your back now and start walking away. There's an angel of the Lord who takes that attribute that's in your heart because you gave it in your heart and begins to transport and teleport it up this supernatural ladder to God in heaven and God takes it and I'm gonna show you what happens. Are you all ready for this? Can y'all handle this so far? Are you okay with this? Y'all okay with this? Y'all okay with this, my brother? Yeah, we're okay. So far, we're okay. Jonathan, Jackie, are we good? We're good. Thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Can I? Ah, that's right. There we go. Two thumbs up. <laughs> are we okay there, Paul? You all right? Two thumbs up. There we go. Well, actually, three, four. There we go. Ah, five thumbs. Big toe. I'm just kidding. Here mortal men receives a tithe, but there who it is witness receives them. If anybody, ever, if anybody ever tells you that the tithe is of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, uh, tell them to explain Hebrews 7, 8, because this is Paul speaking after the, re the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's explaining to us, look, tithe is still enacted, and here mortal men receive tithe. And later on he even says, he who gave tithes, who received tithes, paid tithes. Verse 9, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Melchizedek, which nobody knows is beginning or end. The tithe was established 470 years before the law was ever enacted. 470 years before, before Moses led them to the wilderness, which is where the law was given. So when somebody says tithe is of the of the old law, it's a lie that the devil has told them, but the scriptures stand to be true, that the tithe was first enacted by Abraham the Melchizedek to save Lot, pray for me, have a covering on top of me, and I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna give you 10% of everything that I gain from this wicked kingdom who stole Lot, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna bless you with it, and Melchizedek says, I got you covered, my man. And he came back so rich, and he gave 10%. And that was 470 years before Moses. So if anybody says tithe is of the law, they haven't read their Bible. That's right. And then they say, well, it ended with Jesus on the cross. No, it didn't, because now Paul is teaching about the tithe. Are you all still with me? Nothing was removed. Go to Revelation. <laughs> Uh, Juanita, I'm sorry, I didn't send this to you. Juanita, uh, Revelation chapter 5. And uh, from Revelation chapter 5, I mean, this is so fresh. Revelation chapter 5, I'm going to go then to Revelation chapter 8. So Revelation chapter 5. Now, this is in Revelation. So we're going to see in chapter 5, um, uh, John, the, John, the beloved disciple uh, on Patmos, sees this open vision, he is teleported to heaven, and he sees the supernatural of what we call end times, but it really was uh, uh, the, the life after, or however it's going to be. So, so he begins to, to paint these pictures, and this is where at the be, uh, in verse 8, he, he makes this, this statement. I'm just going to read from here. Hang on, I want to find the best place. Sister Juanita, I'm sorry. I want to find the best place. I don't want to leave anything out of here. So can you go to verse 1? Is it possible for you to move that fast? I know you got software back there. Perfect. It says, And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scrolls and to loosen its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scrolls. Nobody, nobody, nobody in heaven, earth, or under the earth were able to open the scrolls. No one in heaven or on earth, in verse 3, 
of the earth were able to open the scrolls of the book. So I wept <laughs> because no one was found worthy to open, read the scrolls, or to look at it. But one of the elders, wait a minute, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scrolls and to loose its seven seals. This is Jesus. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and on the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a bunch of elders, 24 of them, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Having seven horns and seven eyes, with seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, those seven horns, seven eyes, all that is, is an example of the seven churches. One day I'll teach on all this uh, in a certain class, not on a pulpit here. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And watch what happens. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The elders, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have come up before God. Your prayers and your alms, they go hand in hand. Your prayers and your alms, because giving is a prayer. Giving is a request. Giving is a sowing. It's a tithe offering, gifts of faith, seed, and sacrifice. It's a giving, giving, giving. Father, I'm believing God for this one. Father, I, I'm believing for my family. I'm believing for my business. I'm believing for healing in my body. I, I'm believing for my wife. I'm believing for my husband, restoration of my life. I'm believing for a business. I'm believing to be set free. I'm believing to be removed from addictions and alcoholism and drug addict. I'm trying. I'm believing for peace. I'm believing for love. I'm believing for souls. I'm believing for all of your givings. It's a, it's a worship. Giving is a worship. And it goes up and it appears here in the bowls that the elders have in their hand. Right there. And they go and they worship the lamb that was slain. 24 of them. I want you to see that just for a moment. Let that rest right now in your heart. Every offering you've ever given, every prayer that you've ever said, every Lord help me, Lord do, Lord what, Lord uh, Jesus, whatever prayer, whatever giving, it, it, it's transported supernaturally to heaven and it's placed inside this bowl. And there are these elders that are worshiping our King. And this blows my mind. I believe it because it's written in the, in the pages. I can't deny it because it's posted there. It makes no sense to this carnal brain who has never seen anything like this. So I have to receive it by faith. But one day, I'm going to lay eyes on it. My monument, my memorial, because the word says... We all shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ, kneel before him to be judged of what we've done in our body, good and bad. And when I get there, the book will be open, my memorial, this is the way I'm believing, my memorial will be exposed and it's going to tell all my accolades and all my indiscretions that are not covered under the blood, they're all going to be laid out there. So whenever I do something I should not do, I say, Father, forgive me, cover it with the blood. And that is blotted out. That when I stand there, I believe without a doubt, there's not going to be one indiscretion that shall be listed at all. And I will be, as the scripture says, without spot and without wrinkle because I live a forgiving life, a life of repentance. Forgive me. Those words must roll from your lips quickly at an error. But you must continue to follow along the scriptures and do everything else more purposefully than a sin. Does that make sense? Are y'all seeing this? Huh? Did I lose you all? Did I lose anybody? I pray I haven't. One more scripture. Are you good with one more scripture? Look at this. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. Then... Another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense and that he should offer it 
with the prayers of all the saints and upon the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense, and the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Oh, my friends, when we work, when you work, you generate a payment system that you're receiving in exchange of the life that God gave you, the breath that you have, your hourly value that you have imposed on yourself or the market has forced you to receive. You're exchanging time that you can never get back. And you want your time to be valued something that would never be forgotten. You take your tithes and your offerings, your gifts of faith and your seed and your sacrifice and you lay that before God because God is receiving. When he receives that, you're remembering God and you're honoring him with your first fruits, with your heave offerings, with all your blessings and you're saying, Father, I am rendering back to you the portion in which you have asked or have directed me that I can receive the blessings or that I'm providing my obedience. This is my act of my love and my worship for you. And those resources come into the church. Hear me, they come into the church. They come into the church. And the church is the system in which Jesus died for to feed the poor, take care of the widows, and the orphans. Perfect religion is taking care of the orphans and the widows. Perfect religion, taking care of them ministering to them, reaching out to them the best that we can, touching lives, winning souls, encouraging you to tell people about who Jesus is, to be able to bring these gospels, these scriptures, and spend our time in dedicated life to be able to give you a message that would impact you, that would help you so you can do more for God. Don't you want to do more for God? I want your, you want your value to increase? When I caught this step, when I saw a seam, it was like a golden string stitching Genesis and Deuteronomy and Malachi and, and, uh, and Revelation and Acts and Matthew and Mark. And it just seamed them all. And I said, oh my gosh, this is a system. I, I, I think along the, the lines of systems and my wife be, and I began to apply these things. And to this day, we live our life accordingly. People ask us over and over again, what investment did I do that has given me the life that I have? And I say, I live according to the kingdom's system. That's what comes from my mouth. I live according to the kingdom system. I don't live according to man's system. I live according to the kingdom system. If I make an investment in a business, it's because God said, put an investment in there and I'm gonna wait for the Lord to tell me how to cash it out. That's God's system. If I'm going to arbitrage or trade for services, if I'm going to start a business, it's going to be because God directed it. And I make my investments there. And God renders back to me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. If I obey God, if I disobey God and I move under greed, I'll lose it all. And even that which I thought I had, I'll lose. If I refuse to pay my tithes and my offerings, if I quit funding the ministry, there's no purpose for me to have life on this planet because I'm so convinced I'm gonna squeeze every droplet and every minute that I can to encourage people to preach the gospel or preach the gospel or witness to the individual because no one else wants to preach the gospel with every ounce that I have. This system is designed so you don't have to live a life of desperation or of hunger, or of, of poor credits, or of persecution, or of collectors. God wants to set you free from that. So we've chosen to stand by faith in this church and to believe that we shall live a debt-free life. And there are people this very moment that are, that are beginning to enter into a debt-free life. And some that have already entered in a debt-free life since we've been confessing debt-free. God has set us free from debts here in this church. God set my wife and I free from debt as we continue to declare it. 
Because he wants you to be free so that way you can give freely. Because a man who has a heart, a woman that has a heart of giving, you'll realize you won't fear. If I give it, I'm just going to get a whole lot more back. Because this transportation system, he takes it from me. The angels carry it up to God. And everything God does, he multiplies it and renders it back to me. Are you ready for this? The priest have on the hem of their garment a bell and a pomegranate. How many of you all have heard that? Let me see your hand. Show me your hand. So the priest, the Jewish priest would have a bell and a pomegranate. One's got Baliam, the other one Peliam. Peliam. A bell and a pomegranate. Here's what those words mean. A bell means blessings go up. And pomegranate means hundredfold comes down. Praises go up. Blessings come down. Just the bells and the pomegranate around the priest. Everything God built is so that way he can go. You can give and it goes in here and it multiplies and it comes back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over 30, 60, 100 fold return. Shall be given back to your bosom. Windows of heaven open, blessing poured out. Not room enough to receive. Rebuking of the devil off of your life. Rebuking the devil off of your family. Rebuking the devil off of your business. All nations calling you blessed and you'll be a delightsome land. But the devil whispers in our ears, you don't have to give. What's God going to use your money for? That's how the devil tries to steal from you. Because that's his job. Steal, kill, destroy. But you know what Jesus is? Give you life. And life in abundance. Amen? Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah.